Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar session, Enquiry, Exploration, Problem Solving, Nurturing STEM Thinking in All Young Learners. And I am very excited about this topic because if we inspire young learners, then we will, they will have that same desire and focus to pursue STEM, and STEM education is becoming increasingly important and being recognized. It was always important, but it's um, so important if we want to shape society and the future in the 21st century. So let's get on board to take young children on kind of an, an adventure trip so that we capitalize their natural inclination for curiosity, to ask questions, and, and they have that innate desire to explore things and find out for themselves. So let's make them into 21st century thinkers. So what are we going to be looking at? Um, several of you, a lot of you, may be already doing STEM-focused activities. This webinar session will point out specific strategies you can use in terms of building children's science, mathematics particularly, and maybe a little bit of engineering and technology knowledge base, but at the same time integrating it within your routine. Nothing different from what you always do, except now you have additional focus. How do we weave those STEM thinking skills within your curriculum activities? How do we encourage children to ask questions and problem solve and find out the answers instead of always answering for them? How do we make sure when we design these STEM experiences all of the children, children with special needs and children typically developing without special needs, have a role to play and gain some STEM-focused problem-solving skills, or at least the prerequisite skills. And as we go through this webinar, I will sh try to tie it into popular children's picture books, and some of these books can be even nonfiction books that you can use from age four all the way to about age seven. So let me find out um, who the audience we have. Do we have administrators? Do we have general ed teachers, uh, special ed teachers, parents, physical therapists, occupational therapists? Um, so the numbers are coming in. Oh, I see a lot of speech pathologists. That's wonderful. And they do play a very critical role in the early childhood area and definitely maybe in first, second grade. And you may have other support staff. Okay. Looks like that's it. Occupational therapist, physical therapist. Okay. Um, so the majority are speech pathologists. That's wonderful. On this slide, you will see uh, several of my publications, and two of my publications came out recently, one in December, December, which would be particularly appealing to a speech pathologist or an early childhood teacher uh, because it talks about the book is designed as a parent guide, but it is to be used by school district to either give it to parents or to make it possible for parents to play an active role when they are transitioning from early intervention to preschool and preschool to school age services. That's one of the books that published by LRP came out in December. And the other book that's 
for older children, focusing on uh, addressing behavior. Um, but for this particular webinar, three of the books I borrowed from my own books, and one of them is about executive function. That's the one with the kind of the red cover. And the other one that also gives me a lot of ideas is my book on severe and multiple disabilities. But most importantly, I do have a quick reference guide called STEM Teaching Strategies for Young Children. And then I have several other books on autism and paraeducator training guide. So I bring to this webinar my research and knowledge gained from my books and consulting. So let's begin with why STEM in the early years? The research is showing that when children have math knowledge in the preschool years, it kind of almost predicts what will happen later on in the high school years. So in other words, if a child's exposed and gains good math concepts and knowledge and the application in the early years, later on they are they have higher achievement in the math area when they get to the high school. Apparently, it's even more predictive than early reading skills or attention, which is executive function skills. And one of the things is, as you will find out as we go through this webinar today, high quality early experiences not only build those science and math skills, but it also helps to enrich their literacy skills and their language skills. And most importantly, why STEM? Because the brain grows at the fastest rate in the early years. In other words, the neural connections, as they experience different things and as they are forming concepts, it grows, these connections grow at the rate of one million synapses per second, and the more these experiences are repeated, those synapses get strengthened. So when we think of STEM, what are some thinking skills associated with STEM? We certainly want to enhance the children's natural curiosity and their ability to make inquiries, to think critically. And one of the most important things I do want to mention is we have to encourage children's natural inclination to ask questions. Why, why, why? Let us get them to ask those why questions, and let's not always give them the answers. Let's also encourage them to find out the answers for themselves. So, and the other thing uh, that I want to mention in this context is STEM is not only critical thinking, STEM is also creative thinking. So let's kind of instill that desire to build on their imagination. For example, Instead of giving them worksheets to complete, let's have some open-ended type of thing. Instead of thinking of art as something where they are coloring in, let us get them to imagine. Let them do different things, even if we cannot recognize it as a specific picture of something. Let's, even if it is several colors, you will know, as you, all of you know, many, many of these great artists of this world, their extraordinary imagination is what led to that extraordinary piece of art. And so let's encourage that imagination. Let's do group art. Let's ex get them to explore with paint and markers and color pencils and different types of collages. So let me go ahead and begin with starting with an example. Most of you, if you're working especially in the early childhood or kindergarten area, or if you're a parent, you may be very familiar with the book, Brown Bear, Brown Bear, What Do You See? One of the themes that I'm uh, emphasizing a lot in this webinar are animal themes. And 
I'm sure each one of you is just as fascinated by the behaviors, the habitat, and the classification, and about animals. And as a matter of fact, as I walk, watched through the window this morning, getting ready for this webinar, what I saw excited me. It was a monarch butterfly flying around because I do have the butterfly weed in my yard. So when we think of the story, brown bear, brown bear, what can we do to strengthen critical thinking? How do we make sure we ask multi-level questions so that a child with significant cognitive and communication needs will also be able to take a part? And the child who is higher functioning, who has higher cognitive think thinking skills, we will encourage that child also through asking open-ended or more complex questions where they have to wait, think, and respond more critically. So some of the question samples are provided on this slide. Who has a dog? Such a simple question, they can answer with a yes or no, or if they have a yes or no card, they can lift it up and show everybody I have a dog and show that yes picture. Or if they have an assistive technology device with, with the icon of S yes, um, velcroed onto it, they can press that device. But the next question is much more open-ended. Does a dog make a good pet? And the why? So we want children to be asking these questions later on as we train them. That's a question depending on the child. Some child may say yes. Some children may say no. I like to have a bird if they have a bird as a pet. Can you have a bear as a pet? And why, and why not? Why can't we have a bear as a pet? Again, this is promoting critical thinking. So the way we tailor those questions is critical, and we sometimes focus so much on just the reading part, we don't stop in the middle to ask these questions, and it is important that we ask these questions. Where would you see a red bird or a yellow duck? So... That's building recall, attention, and working memory. Have you seen a blue horse or a purple cat? Are blue horses and purple cats imaginary? And further knowledge, science knowledge, is, is a bear a mammal? And so that requires, is it a reptile? So that requires much more science knowledge. And we've used this opportunity through this story to build that knowledge. One of the other things that you can do is play verbal games with your students. And uh, that way you can build science knowledge. And this will also be a lot of fun for the kids. So you can have a group activity where you can say, I am going to the zoo, and after the story is over, after you have read or you, assuming you have shared brown bear, brown bear, the follow-up activity, either immediately following it or sometime a little bit later when you gather the whole group, you can say each person has to name an animal at the zoo and the teacher will begin and they have to focus attention because they have to remember the animal name that the previous child named as well, and then this will keep on building and building and building, and they really have to focus attention because you, they have to remember the animal names that the other children said. So they don't repeat the same thing, but they come up with a new name, but they also have to remember. So this is a good way to train, and if after five or six students they forget, then you can restart it so that nobody feels like they have lost it. So that's one way you can play. And you can also do this while you are lining up. You can say, okay, each person has to name an animal. That will prevent them from eating each other, pushing each other as they are, so they will, take, they will have to take turns. The person in the first starts by naming an animal, and then the next person and the next person. That time it's not a game like this. They are just naming the words. But another way so that you don't have to resort to all kinds of direction. Okay, you have to be quiet. You cannot make noise. Uh, you don't need to push each other. You have to stand straight. You have to put your uh, fingers on. 
none of those is needed. They just have to repeat those names or they have to say an animal name. So that's another way to use. Here on this slide, I am excited to share with you. I took these photographs when I had the opportunity to present in South Africa. So I got to go and visit Animal Safari. And here I saw these animals in their natural habitat. So what I suggest to you, if you can find pictures of animals, put them on your science wall and do change these pictures every few weeks so that it was a continuous kind of picture wall, but at the same time helping to build science knowledge on the animal theme. Some children, you are going to ask them to point to the elephant or point to the lion when they are choosing the science center or they are looking at pictures on the science wall. And another easy question is, is an elephant big or a penguin big? That is at the easy level, big and small. Then you can make it more complex. And what are some characteristics? What is the natural habitat for penguins? What is the natural habitat for, and they learn the word habitat as well. What's the natural habitat for a zebra? And these are all pictures, for example, I took within fairly close distance of these animals. So this is their natural habitat. They were not in a zoo. And then you can make it even more complex where they are identifying whether the animal is a bird, a reptile, or a mammal. And then you can work on the characteristics of mammals, reptiles. So you are increasingly building their knowledge, but nobody is left out because you also have those easy questions built into this science wall. So another game that you can play, the wild games. Games are a way all of you know is to increase the joy of learning so that children feel they're not playing a game. They are not thinking that I have to learn this. It automatically comes in to their thinking and into their natural vocabulary because they are playing it as a game. And it has to be, of course, all-inclusive. And some children will you have a part or uh, uh, they will play a part using maybe uh, a voice output uh, technology. So I spy an animal. So let's say you are in the cafeteria. There's going to be a big assembly. They are gathering. And make sure that you don't go and sit right in the front, maybe at the back, if especially if you have children with some discipline or a behavior issues, sit at the back. And then with your group, you can play this game of I spy an animal as quietly as possible. But at the same time, it is very difficult for children to wait for 15 minutes, 10 minutes even, or even five minutes before the actual program begins. Use that opportunity to play the I spy an animal game, describe a couple of features, and have children guess what it is. Or then you can kind of name some information about that to give additional clues for them to be able to name. Then you can also play the 20 questions game. And you can also play an animal bingo game using animal pictures. These are all things to build vocabulary at the same time science knowledge. One of the things I do want to emphasize is try to address the needs of children who have significant cognitive and communication difficulties through providing the opportunity to access that information in multiple ways. Some will use pictures. For some of them, you can actually have toy animals as a way for them to connect. OK, so this is an elephant. This is the toy elephant, a miniature elephant. And so that's the features. It has a trunk so that it gets 
into their brain and it becomes a, a synapse. And when you repeat it over and over again, they will remember that that particular toy, miniature toy, is an elephant. And then you connect it with the picture of the elephant. And then, of course, we use assistive technology for them to press, to hear the word animal, uh, elephant. Another thing that you can do, which is a very simple activity in order to focus on their writing ability and begin that writing as soon as possible, even at kindergarten level, depends on the adaptation that you provide and depends on the supports you provide. Some children in kindergarten and first grade will be able to copy, uh, let's say, the name of an animal. Some will be able to, given blanks, put that name of that animal to fill in the blank. So let's make a story. And you can certainly do it as a group activity using your chart, and then they go back and create their book. Like, let's say, you know, you following the pattern presented in brown bear, brown bear, you can say, butterfly, butterfly, what do you see? I see a bird looking at me. Uh, butterfly, butterfly, what do you see? I see a leaf looking at me. Butterfly, butterfly, what do you see? I see a flower looking at me. So this is something you can begin as early as pre-K, and certainly it is something you can continue in first definitely in first grade where they are maybe copying butterfly, butterfly from that text or they already have that pre-written sentence and they are given some blank, blanks and then they have the word and they put that word in that blank. So, and then display it in the science center so that when children go back, um, they will have the opportunity to look over their own books or look over the books that their friend has created and do that. Another beautiful book for animals, which is for even younger children, definitely pre-K and even three-year-old, is The Deer Zoo by Rod Campbell. And that's kind of a fascinating book because it kind of you can open up. It's a pop-up book. Okay, and the other thing, one of the things that I personally love is role-playing and drama and uh, playing different roles. So you can certainly, after reading that book, Brown Bear, Brown Bear, and we do not have to say, okay, we are finished, and then I have to move on to next book and next book and next book. But there are many books written by Eric Carl, The Grouchy Ladybug, The Very Busy Spider, The Very Hungry Caterpillar, that all focus on animals, and you can use them on different days, or you can have the same book repeated, but tie it up with another activity. Like, for example, role-playing movements of animals. Walk like a bear, swim like a fish, and they do these different things. And a question may arise about how children who have physical difficulties, how can they get involved? One of the things is they can, that person who's, who is non-ambulatory can definitely have a card with a picture and that says shows a picture of a bear and then all of the others do that action walking like a bear and this child who is non-ambulatory can hold up the card that says fly like a bird or hop like a rabbit or they have an assistive technology device programmed with these directions movement direction and press that device you can have, actually, if you have two children using uh, wheelchairs to ambulate, you can give one child the picture, the other child the voice, uh, voice output so that they can provide the direction, so that every child has a role to play. And if there are things that they can do with their arms, they can do. Fly like a bird, they can certainly move their arms if they can move their arms. And they can also do sound effects, given a musical instrument to go with a particular thing, or if they can if they can have the toy of like a little uh, rubber snake or something, they can have it move it around or they can show it to everybody. Okay, now we talked about science and literacy. And now we are going to move into the math. And uh, one of the thing, first things uh, is we have to encourage that love for math in all children. Never, ever... If you're a parent, never ever say 
that I know I was never good at math. No. Everybody can be good at math. It's often our application and our approach that makes a tremendous difference. And it is also important for these young learners to have some three-dimensional objects to go with those numbers so that they don't only see the abstract symbols, but they also see some objects that connect with that. So when you use plastic uh, bear counters, at the same time, try to use foam dies. And uh, you, know, you can get it at the dollar store. These are huge foam dies. And uh, they can take turns rolling the dies, and then they match that number on the top of the dies with a similar equivalent set of bear counters. So that's a simple activity they can do. And for some children who, are, uh, who have significant needs, they may just roll the dice. And if that is difficult, maybe they can have a Velcroed glove and they can, you can attach two or three bear counters with Velcro circles and they look at those circles and then they count or they begin to count one, two. And then for some others, let's say you are at the first grade level and you're beginning addition. They can roll the dice, two of them, and then they can count and add the two numbers together. And they can, I mean, later on I'll share with you how they can make it into a number sentence. Another thing that's very appropriate at this kindergarten pre-K level is making size comparison, which animal is larger, which animal is smaller, which is longer a snake or a caterpillar, so that it gets them to think. Even though these are fairly simple questions, we want them to think. And then we also need to add on another kind of activity where we ask the child, oh, you're, you have to ask here, Sue, another question. And then Sue has to ask another child a question. So we want to give that opportunity for them to be able to ask questions. And we can model it for them first, and then they ask another child, their peer, a question. And then it's a good idea to kind of, let's say you are moving on to the math area, and then you have a math center. Instead of just having numbers, constantly displayed on the walls, make sure that you have, yes, you can have numbers, that's okay, but in, go much more beyond displaying just numbers. From time to time, every three weeks at least, try to display different types of math activities that you're doing on that math center wall. For example, you can make a chart of a large animal gradually going down to the level of, let's say, a ladybug. Let's say you have a whale, and then you have an elephant, and then going down, and then you can have sometimes tallest animal to the shortest animal. Um, and, for example, Eric Kohl's book on the grouchy ladybug shows a variety of uh, animals, and you can place that book right next to it because that kind of shows different animals and their sizes as well. Um, one of the things that we often do display in our walls is the shapes. But it is important, I think maybe most of you do not do that, but I have seen occasionally where they show these shapes, but they do have, have these shapes displayed as kind of persons with arms and legs, but it is important that we show the shapes as shapes with either, you know, if it's a triangle with three sides and three corners, a circle has no sides, and a square has four sides and four corners, and later on when they learn about angles, they will be able to connect the corners and the angles well together. So have them create these shapes. You know, 
uh, say, assign a group and they can make large shapes. They can make the shapes themselves, and then you can display it. You can use a variety of materials, toothpicks, yarn, felt pieces, so that they understand that there are three corners to a triangle. Uh, and, so, and then a rectangle has longer sides and shorter sides. So these are all some ways that is interactive, hands-on, and will excite children. The other thing is to do math, walk, and talk. For example, uh, as you are going outside and you are going to the ca cafeteria or you are going for recess outside, it's a good opportunity to give each child a, a task. Okay, your job is to count a number of steps from here to the outside. And they all may come up with different numbers, but that's fun. Who has the highest, the highest number of steps? Who, who has the lowest number of steps? Is 53 steps more than 31 steps? So you can ask these kind of questions, but at the same time you are constantly building their knowledge. And there is no need to say, stay, on, stay in line. I want you to keep your hands behind your back. None of that is needed because each one is given an interesting task, and now they are focused on their steps. Because they are focused on their steps and counting, they are less likely to push each other or engage in inappropriate activities. They would be much more engaged in the appropriate activities, and we will make learning part of life. And one of the other things that I mentioned about previously, playing the dice game, one of the interesting things is, when you're sitting in a circle, and maybe if you have a parent educator, you can have maybe two groups, and they are having a circle. And in that circle, each child takes a turn to roll the dice. And then before rolling the dice, they make a prediction. I am going to get six. I am going to get five. And if, if you're doing it, for example, at the first grade level, and you're beginning to teach addition, and because these numbers are all below six, so you can say, okay, you can roll two dice, but before you roll the two dice, you're going to predict what numbers will come. So it's kind of building, let's say, a small way towards probability. And then they can see, just for fun, if they predict it correctly. But certainly what they can do, after they have rolled the dice, they can make a number statement, put that number three dots in one plus one dot in the other equals, and you have a pre-prepared card, either, you know, and then they put the numbers and they add the numbers together. They can use the concrete form dice as an aid in adding together, or they can do it in their head so that you have different levels of challenge. The other fun activity that you can do is to make it a shape hunt. So it's like a scavenger hunt. They go through, and each team of two children, depending on the number of students you have, or a team of four children, they have to find all the triangles in the room, all the rectangles in the room, all the um, octagons in the room, all the pentagons in the room, all the squares, so circles. So, and then they have a check mark. Each time they find, they put a little check mark. That's all they have to do. And when, at the end, they can share where they found it, if they remember. That would be good. It, you know, some may be able to remember, some may not be able to, but that's one activity that will get them on their feet and move around, and especially if you have children who tend to be fidgety and restless, they need to get up and move around. We sometimes have a tendency to have young children, five-year-olds, sitting for half an hour, and then we are asking for trouble because that's difficult for them. But this kind of weaving, these kind of games and activities will reduce our need to focus exclusively on behavior redirection. Okay, I have a set of questions. Do you try to combine and ask and pose easy questions and complex questions, and do you personalize it to the student when you're asking these questions? Looking at the child so that every child has an opportunity to respond in some way, so you change and adapt the question. That's what it is. Do you have a 
science, math kind of center, and a word wall associated with it where you are teaching different concepts in math or science. Do you play math group games? Do you integrate kind of literacy books with STEM? I'm sure a lot of you do that. And do you routinely ask open-ended question that does not have necessarily any right or wrong answers, but it builds their thinking. Okay. Looks like most of you are done. I'm going to skip. Okay. Possibly after this webinar, you oh we do have some somebody oh it's still going on. Uh, majority of you do ask open-ended questions. That is absolutely wonderful because when we ask open-ended questions, it's it's even for us as adults. When we have to come up with answers, we do not know beforehand that it is a red one, that the red bird is red, the brown bear is brown, as simple as that, to we do not know the answer to questions. We all become discoverers, and that's what science is all about. That's what STEM is all about. So I'm glad that a lot of you do uh, use um, open-ended questions, and we have to also try to personalize it. I see some of you do personalize it uh, to individual children, and math and science wall. And I have um, a couple of ideas in this webinar where I'm sharing with you some ideas for math and math and science word wall. And we most of us do have like a vocabulary word wall, but math and science have their own vocabulary too, and it will help build that. Okay, going on about math again, uh, measure the height. You know, when they are standing in line, or get them to stand in line, and let them arrange themselves in the, from the shortest person to the tallest person or from the tallest to the shortest, and then they can answer the questions themselves. And in this context, of course, many of you, I'm sure, uh, use this book, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, to do the three sizes, the large, medium, and small, and then they can make their own, you know, this could be like a craft activity. They uh, can make kind of little miniature chairs uh, using, let's say, craft sticks, and then you can usually use uh, plastic or preferably paper uh, bowls and put them in the right order. And maybe, again, they can use a drawing, drawing uh, in their art center or coloring and paint, or paintbrushes, that is, to make three different beds. And it won't, may not look anything like bed, but as long as the size difference is visible to us, we accept all answers. And when they are playing at the sand table, um, you know, or the, if you have rice or if you have beans at the uh, table uh, uh, or you have a big, like, a area where you are doing this, like maybe you use a plastic container for this, uh, have them measure. Get them involved in how many spoons of rice or sand or uh, beans do you have to put in to make a cup of rice or a cup of beans because beans and rice, because of their size, it may bring about different things. And of course, it depends on the child's ability to pick up to, but this will make them think, what is the capacity of a spoon compared to the capacity of a cup? And, and the simplest one, if you have a water table, is to how many cups of water to fill the container, and then gradually you can teach about volume. And then another activity related to measurement is comparing the weights of objects. In other words, again, they sit in a circle, and they have two objects, one that's light, like a feather, another one that's maybe a magnet, 
and they say, is the magnet heavier or the feather is heavier? And they t- take turns going around, and they all experience that. And this kind of hands-on activity is going to increase their motivation, increase their engagement. And this teaches kind of length and area and capacity and weight, all part of your math measurement. And an important concept in the area of math, which begins at the preschool level and algebra, it goes on to algebra and algebra, the foundation is uh, patterns. So get children to recognize, and this could be part of part of your math center and posted on the math center. Get them to recognize, get them to create patterns with increasing complexity, you know, with shapes, with numbers. They can make a pattern with the numbers. They can make a pattern with colors. They can make a pattern with large, medium, small, large, medium, small, large, medium, what comes next. That may be the easiest one. And then you can go into like two, four, six, Eight, what comes next. So now number pattern, and then of course a shape pattern. And then give them the task. You create a pattern and teach them how to generate a pattern. Um, and then get them to find patterns in, as they are walking down the hall or in your classroom or on the tiles on the floor. Um, and then when they are building something at the block center, they can have a red Lego, yellow, blue. Red, yellow, blue, and then they make a square out of that, and that becomes the foundation of the structure that they are creating. Here, again, uh, using the Very Hungry Caterpillar book, or you can use the Grouchy Ladybug book, and then you can create that, and you can post this on your science wall, which are some, it is a very simple one. What, you know, they have learned about the butterfly, or they have learned about the uh, ladybug. What are some other insects? Can you name the insects? And then they get to see it and do attach pictures, or if you have small three-dimensional object representing a ladybug or representing a grasshopper, do attach it for those students who need concrete representation and need something more than the picture. It is important at this early level when they are building concepts that they have the opportunity to have touch and feel and tactile element to it, and this will also help students who have visual difficulties. And then teach about the life skills, um, life cycle, sorry, not life skill, life cycle. You know, butterfly and frog. And they, you, they can sequence it. They can put them in the order. And these shapes that uh, I have, the, the egg, the caterpillar, the pupa, they are all foam shapes, so you can get it. It's possible. Or the children can use um, Chanel stems and tissue paper and make their own butterfly. And uh, they can put it in order, and they can match it with the word, match it with the text. Um, so that's another way. And this could also be the follow-up activity from learning about insects on the world wall to life cycle. And you can remove all this at the end of the day, and they go back and put it in the right order. And then each child who plays with it, they remove all of that so that the next child who comes in and plays at the science center have to put it in the right order. So they build their knowledge. And for a child who has significant difficulties, they just have to match, put two things, or they match it to a pattern that you have given them showing the life cycle. They just match it and put it in that first one is egg, and, you know, in that order. The other book that I'm sure most of you are familiar with is The Very Busy Spider. And... It's important for them to know about spiders. And then you can even take it to an advanced level for your first grader. Why do spiders spin webs? So that they can catch their prey on that web. You know, so that you are teaching about the natural world that surrounds them. 
later on it can turn into their protection of the environment. So you're building that rudimentary skills necessary for that knowledge about science, but also taking care of the environment and then feeling a sense of pride about the knowledge they are gaining and also knowing more about their environment. So we want to increase their understanding, children's understanding of the natural world, the physical world, and then improve their observation skills, uh, improve their classification skills. So even if you are teaching first grade, you can certainly pull a picture book because picture book speaks volumes because of the extraordinary illustrations that are available in picture books. And of course, there are lots and lots of pictures of these animals that is available from a variety of sources. And one of the best sources for pictures uh, uh, is the National Geographic uh, group of books. They have fantastic books, and their website also offers some phenomenal videos. So you can take advantage of all of this in this today's world of technology. Many of you do have smart boards, and you can show that. But we have to make sure that we don't sit in front of that smart board for a long period of time. The videos have to be short, like three minutes, four minutes, and then turned off so that we engage the children in an interactive type of activity, hands-on activity, through our questioning, the children questioning each other, and then making something. So why do spiders spin webs? What are webs made of? How many pairs of legs do something easier they have? Why is a spider different from an insect? Why is it called an arachnid? Because of the eight legs, whereas an insect that they just had, like a butterfly, has six legs. So, and as I mentioned, National Geographic has great books. They have a book called uh, Caterpillar to Butterfly full of beautiful pictures, and they, it can address something very simple at the preschool level all the way to advanced vocabulary uh, at the first, second grade level. Um, and it, I, yeah, as I say, it, it is called From Caterpillar to Butterfly. It's a beautiful book. Um, as I said before, set up a science challenge center. The slide that I showed earlier on with four different animals, uh, penguins, elephant, zebra, and the lion, three of them happen to be mammals, and the other one is a bird, and you can have a snake picture which will make it a reptile so, uh, or an insect picture. So what you want to show is, and then, or you can say you can have a series of pictures vertically, and then you can have velcroed habitat pictures, and then they match the habitat with that animal. That can be part of your discovery centers. Um, you can also have uh, animal ca classification, which is, you know, the set of animal pictures. They put it either in the mammal section or the reptile section, depending on whether it's a mammal or a reptile. So then they, and then right next to it, you kind of uh, explain, and you also read this particular book, which is very good, which shows chickens are not the only ones. That's a great book. Again, it's a picture book. You can read that in this combination and then teach them about what are mammals and what are reptiles, how are they different from each other. Um, this is another piece for you to create like a science wall. Again, going back from the caterpillar story, from the hungry caterpillar, which many, many of us read, what are some characteristics, physical characteristics of insects? This is at the next level. This may be your first grade, or maybe if you have all students who are high functioning uh, in the kindergarten, you can, you can begin that, and you can have students who have cognitive difficulties, pointing, touching, using an assistive technology device, having an object, concrete representation of an insect. And then you build them their knowledge about the habitat, about their basic needs, and the life cycle. We have looked at all of them. What are their basic needs? They need to be in there something that is 
as close to their natural habitat as possible. And I am drawing this from my, uh, adapting it and borrowing it, let's say, from my book because the publisher owns the copyright. Um, so science is really a systematic study of the structure of the natural world and the physical world. The sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, and what happens, the interconnection, how they are associated with each other. And um, I'm sure recently you heard about the black hole. So, you know, you have some advanced students. They can find out a little bit. So you are challenging different students at different levels, and you are building that eagerness for that exploration, inquiry-based thinking. Um, create that thirst for them to find out more and more. And I'm going to show, share some more ideas on creating hands-on activities. Get them to do experiments. Let them discover how things work. Almost every week, maybe at the beginning on Monday, you introduce some kind of a maybe new item, or at least every two weeks that is science or math related, and that inspire them to start thinking and exploring. And get parents involved too. So for example, you can have a simple activity at the preschool, kindergarten level, which objects float and which objects sink. And why do some objects float, whereas some objects sink? What factors impact that? And so then ask them questions. And then you can have, at the same science center, you can have a magnet. Magnets attract objects that contain iron. But magnet repels objects that do not contain any iron. So they can, you can, they can put the pictures right below that. Or if they have real objects, because um, you may have a paper clip, you may have a coin, and they can put a little piece of Velcro on that, and they can attach it to the display chart. So these are all things that you can routinely do and connect it with a literacy book and connect it with that discovery center and children are engaged in hands-on learning and that becomes lively and engaging and reduces naturally the behavioral issues while increasing student learning and desire for inquiry. Critical thinking, open-ended. Several of you said, uh, almost a lot of you said that you routinely use open-ended question. So here is one thing. I mean, we all know that we get rain, heavy rain sometimes, but sometimes we don't get any rain. So a simple question is, what would happen if it didn't rain for months? So you can use like a brainstorming tool, and you have always a chart available. And all that you are doing in that middle circle, you are changing that picture and the topic that you are. But the brainstorming tool is always present, and you use that routinely in order to brainstorm different types of uh, questions as well as responses. So what would happen if it didn't rain for months? And what would happen if all the lakes and the rivers and the ponds, everything dried up? Get them, you know, and accept all answers. Encourage every child to contribute. And what child with significant needs in advance, give a picture. And one of the things that I would like to mention is using invisible support. Invisible support is, if a child is usually a little anxious and is not ready to answer or hesitant, ask a simple question. Did we have rain? Did we get any rain yesterday? Or did, are we going, you know, that kind of a very simple question like yes or no, we didn't get any rain. Uh, uh, that's one way. That's kind of invisibly provided. Or you ask a question to a student 
who you usually think answers correctly, and then repeat that same question to that child who is kind of anxious, stressed, or not always ready to volunteer. Ask that same question so that they can just be listening and respond, or provide a picture cue. So that give every child an opportunity to be part of that group, to feel good about themselves. So, and then ask questions like, what if it rained every day? What do you think would happen? And uh, use that brainstorming tool for other types of open-ended questions too. Like, what are five things you can do to help the world? What are some things, this is, would be more at the maybe first grade level. What are some things you can do to help a friend? And this is from the perspective of a social emotional perspective. And this should, can be built in as part of that creative, open-ended uh, brainstorming technique. Can you play with her? Can you share? I mean, you can volunteer. Uh, uh, you can have students who are volunteering answers, or you can start it off with giving one answer and the children generate the other answers. Five things I can do when I'm feeling sad. Five things I can do to help my classroom stay clean. So these are all things, open-ended questions. And there is a beautiful book I recently came across. I'm sure many of you would love this book. It's called 10 Things I Can Do to Help My World. It's full of pictures. It can be done even at the preschool, kindergarten level. It's full of pictures, and it's very attractive very well put together. So you can use that book. And uh, I wanted to reemphasize the need to apply the universal design for uh, learning principles, that is providing access to every child, providing opportunity to every child to express their response in some form, and providing every way to present the information to the children so that all of them can access that information. And as I said before, easy level to higher complexity level. And I mentioned about the invisible support. One of the powerful tools is to give choices. They have to select from three choices given and sometimes maybe even two choices so that all children have the opportunity to respond. Uh, and then make sure build in transition activities, movement activities, games, to sustain the student motivation and build their attention, and that attention is very critical for math science. And um, have children who are fidgety take short breaks for three minutes, and most importantly, not just good job, make a positive, encouraging comment about what they are doing right. I like the way you're sitting still. Oh, I like the way you try to answer that question. Good try. And of course, use AT supports. These are kind of response tools that you can use. As I mentioned, you can use I talk to communicator with yes, no response, or you can use index cards. You can create three-column charts. You can also, at the Science Center, attach objects like a magnet and then label it with its name, a microscope, magnifier, you know, different things, and then label it. You can use a variety of assistive technology tools. All of these are from AbleNet, I talk to communicator, talking bricks, and then you can have a science word and maybe possibly a picture or a foam item or an object next to it. So these are all different things to build vocabulary. And you can use like the super talker, and then you can have the top four as numbers and the bottom four as the corresponding objects. And um, in terms of engineering, which is we don't think of engineering when we think of young children, but engineering begins with block play. When children play with blocks, it helps them to learn math faster because it improves their spatial skills. So this was a study that was done. They looked at 
three-year-old children from different socioeconomic levels. And those children who were able to use blocks, and by the way, Lego blocks are great block toys to encourage children to build different types of structures. Um, and make a model for them and let them imitate that model when they are building a structure. For example, you can say, we are going to make a zoo. You make a zoo. We need different types of enclosures for different animals. An elephant, would it need a big enclosure or a small one? What about for a little um, monkey? What do we need? So try to get them to think and this would become the beginnings of engineering. And in the resources section, I have a link that I have added that I have not put it as a video. It's a video. You can watch that video as well uh, at your leisure. Um, and in terms of technology, as a matter of fact, I run a nonprofit, and I have a couple of teenagers who helped uh, create this. They did some research and found these are all the, uh, apps that you can use uh, to build technology skills. And there is the Lightbot. It's a programming puzzle game. And there are several others. And this one, most all of them, I think, are free, so they don't cost anything. One is called Scratch Junior, and the other one is called Science. And um, I know I'm going over time, but this one is again acted to make drama. How do we make all learning fun and joyful? Drama integrated with science. Combine it with the story of Papa. Please get the moon for me and assign different roles to different children. And if you can make the art, in other words, you can make the sun's picture and if you can make the earth picture during an art activity, the children make it themselves. Um, and if necessary, you can provide a stencil or it can be their own imagination of a sun and a moon and a star. And then they can hold those cords as they are doing the movement for this drama. Um, in other words, you have the sun in the middle, and the Earth's orbit is rotates around the sun, and then the moon rotates, or the orbit of the moon around the Earth. And then you can use students who will have difficulty ambulating or sitting in a, maybe using a wheelchair to be the role of, to play the role of the sun. So you can use it, and you can use AT devices, and you can use picture supports, or you can use some craft work that you have done for them to hold. So this will create a lot of laughter and a lot of fun when they are actually, the earth is orbiting around the sun and the moon is orbiting, and then there are different stationary stars who are holding, or somebody can hold the picture of the sky, and it's a lot of fun. So make STEM a joyful experience, create lots of hands-on activities, encourage children's natural love for exploration, and get parents involved. Um, and a number of resources, some of them are my own books, and then there are some other resources that I mentioned about, like the video, the engineering is elementary, and the National Science Teachers Association has some research articles, and there are some online games that are also included in these resource section. Thank you, everyone. I'm sorry I went over by a few minutes. Um, Okay, there is a question. Let me answer it before I go further. How do we access the video for building blocks? The, it's not exactly a video for building blocks. You may find something at the LEGO Foundation website. I have not explored it. But the one that I mentioned is called Engineering is Elementary, and you can access that through. Maybe you can copy that. Um, uh, link 
or you can type that link into your web browser and you can ask access that video and i'm sure lego comes up with a lot of ideas and designs for you to build with blocks so but i am not familiar that there is a particular video there may be a video on their site i'm not sure about that but if you're looking for the research article um, you can search for that information it came out uh, several years ago um, so I want to thank AbleNet University for hosting the webinar, and I want to thank each and every one of you for joining this webinar. Let's go on this adventure trip for ourselves and for the kids we teach. Let them be 21st century thinkers and go on this wonderful trip to learn more through STEM experiences. The next webinar is a completely different topic. It's not just focused on young learners. It's promoting and advancing personal living skills and self-dependence in students with severe and multiple disabilities. Again, thank you, everyone, and thank you to AbleNet.